Welcome to the Aerospace Advantage podcast. I'm your host, John Slickbaum. Here on the Aerospace Advantage, we speak with leaders in the DoD, industry, and other subject matter experts who explore the intersection of strategy, operational concepts, technology, and policy when it comes to air and space power. So if you like learning about aerospace power, you are in the right place. To our regular listeners, welcome back. And if it's your first time here, thank you so much for joining us. As a reminder, if you like what you're hearing today, do us a favor and follow our show. Please give us a like and leave a comment so that we can keep charting the trajectories that matter to you most. Recently, we've been talking a lot about tech on the Aerospace Advantage, and we do that to make sure that everybody is informed. But at the end of the day, it boils back down to airmen in the fight. So we are going to take a snapshot of time during the Vietnam War and talk to Colonel Retired Robert Graham. And I want to bring in Doug Berkey because, Doug, I tell you, Talking to these men and women that were there in the fight, it is exactly what we need to be focused on and what we're doing here at the Aerospace Advantage. No, thanks. Like, and we've been talking a lot about Colonel Graham because he's a close personal friend to you and a mentor, and you're very lucky to have him in your life. And in many ways, our episode with Gene Smith earlier in the year as Vietnam POW we were with really drove home the need to occasionally look back in history and apply the lessons learned and what does it mean for air power today and tomorrow? And so we we're chatting over the phone the other day and said, let's bring Colonel Graham on. And I just listened to the track on this for the raw recording. And these are powerful stories. And so I just think that the audience is going to get a lot out of this because there's so much that applies for where we are right now. But if you could give us a quick rundown on his career so people kind of have a mental map when they're listening to these stories. Absolutely. So like you said, of course, I feel very lucky to be friends with Bob Graham. And we started just going out to lunch on Wednesdays and just spending time with him and doing a little bit of work with him has just absolutely been incredible because the story is one that they're going to write books about because he enlisted in the Air Force. He had a, a short stint as a navigator after he became a commissioned officer and then goes to pilot training. So that's a story you hear in the Air Force, but what you don't hear is the fact that he had four tours and over 500 missions in Vietnam, starting out in the F-100. Then he gets pulled over to the CIA. He is flying essentially bird dogs in Vietnam, one of the first FACAs that is executing over there in clandestine operations. He goes back to the F-100, flies again, punches out, flies with a broken back, and then goes to the hospital, realizes when he gets out of the hospital that his squadron has been deployed. And if he goes back to the base, he'll obviously get reassigned to another squadron and not go to war. So he gets himself to Vietnam, rejoins the squadron, flies a third mission to where he receives the Silver Star, the th nation's third highest honor, and then caps it out going through some other assignments, teaching at Luke and eventually becoming the fourth fighter squadron commander flying the F-4 in Vietnam on his fourth tour. The stories are riveting, and it is just a testament to airmen stepping up and doing the job when they're asked to do it. Now, that is really awesome. So, dude, let's turn it over to the track and listen to your interview. Bob, thanks so much for sitting down with me. I know we've been wanting to do this for a long time. Okay, John, thanks a lot for having me. I've been looking forward to this, and I've certainly listened to a lot of your podcasts in the past, so now I'm an active participant. Yeah, Bob, I know you've been with the Aerospace Advantage since day one, and I do appreciate that. And we're going to really just jump right into it, because you've had an incredible career, four tours in Vietnam and 29 years of service, and retired in 1982, but you have not stopped working since. Life has been good. Bob, you and I share that we're both prior enlisted. You did three years as an enlisted man and then went to aviation cadets and did a short stint as a navigator before you went to pilot training. Yeah, that actually worked out uh, really well because it introduced me to fighter aviation. I went in the uh, Air Defense Command, I flying in the backseat of F-94s and did that for about three years. And then we were coming back from picking up an airplane, coming back through Nellis and I met for the very first time a bunch of fighter pilots flying the F-100 out of Nellis. And after a long night at the bar, I decided that's what I wanted to be when I grew up. And so I went off to pilot training and fortunately got an F-100 assignment and flew the airplane for another probably 10 or 12 years. 
Yeah, and pretty neat to note that your first squadron commander was Chappie James, right? He was a pistol. I was a brand new second lieutenant just trying to figure out where the front door was, and working for him was just pure joy. He's a class act. Yeah, obviously lucky to have met a few of the leaders from that time frame, and that has been the one thing that was always said about Chappie James, just a class act was how it was always described. So now you're flying the F-100, and I want to set the stage for everybody that you are stationed in Misawa, Japan, flying the F-100. You know, you're a young captain, and you get a call to go to Tokyo. So the way it worked out was it's 1962, long time ago. I'm a probably the junior captain in the world. And we got a request for a volunteer to go down to Vietnam and work for a civilian company down there as a technical advisor to the Vietnamese Army and Air Force. Now, you did share with me, so I really want to make sure that our audience understands, you basically get told, hey, go down to an unmarked office and meet with somebody. Can you explain how that meeting went? It was kind of abrupt. When they said, okay, we're going to discharge you from the Air Force, you're going to go to work for, as I recall, the company's name was the American Botanical Survey Corporation, which at the time, I didn't realize it was very appropriate because I got to survey a lot of botanicals while I was overworking in the jungle in Vietnam. But anyway... So I got a civilian passport, got all civilian clothes, got discharged from the Air Force and went to work for this particular company. Yeah, I think it's just so different to think that you're flying one day in an F-100 squadron and the next day you're a civilian working for a botanical company and they sent you down to Vietnam to start flying essentially the O-1 propeller. It's a tandem seat Cessna 172. So talk to us about what that experience was like. So this is going to be like a trip back to World War I, I think, for most people. But anyway, I was up at Da Nang, or just outside of Da Nang in the northern part of South Vietnam. They had a squadron there that, as John said, was flying O-1s, probably got them from the French when the French, I guess it was about five years earlier before when the French uh, left Vietnam. But anyway, they put out a call and they said, we're going to check out five ex-Air Force officers to fly with Vietnamese Air Force and O-1 reconnaissance airplanes. The story went something like this. They said, we want to have people with a lot of experience in prop airplanes and particularly tail draggers and all of that. And so I knew that my flight records were in a vault back in California and nobody had access to them. So I implied, I didn't lie, but I implied that I had a lot of experience. Obviously, I was an F-100 pilot. You get a lot of experience fast in that airplane. And I sort of implied that since I had flown the T-34 in pilot training, that I had quite a bit of prop experience. It may have been a slight exaggeration, but as a result of that, I got assigned to the squadron, had about, uh, I want to say, maybe 12 airplanes. They looked like they'd been around since World War I, by the way, all canvas no protection, no armament, no nothing. Anyway, in order to save face, the captain, the commander of the squadron, decided that he would check me out because I also had been a captain. And so a couple of days before my checkout, we looked around, looked all over, talked to people, whoever we could find, to see if there was any manuals on the airplane, any instruction whatever, to try to figure out how to start it, how to taxi it, what airspeeds it flew at, how high it could go, things like that. Turns out there was no information at all. So the first day, it's time for my checkout. We have an interpreter in the briefing room, and it's the three of us in the briefing room. And the interpreter said, the captain wants to know if you have any questions. And I said, yeah. I said, my first question is, I don't know how to start the airplane. So can you give me some information on that? And the captain said, you don't have to worry about that. He said, I'll get the crew chief to start the airplane for you. Okay. I asked him about tax and he says, don't worry about it. I said, how about, how fast do we take off? How fast, how many miles per hour are we going when we take off? The guy said, 
whatever feels comfortable. I went, well, okay. And then I said, what airspeed do we turn base at, fly final at, land at? And he said, same thing, whatever feels comfortable for you. He said, do you have any other questions? And I said, no, I guess not. That pretty much covers everything. We walk out to the ramp and we jump in the airplane. He jumps in the back and the back cockpit, they also had a stick that you could put in and take out so that he could fly the airplane from the back seat. So he takes the stick out, straps it to the side of the cockpit. So now we know who's in charge of the controls. Crank it up. The taxi out to number one position was not a work of art. I covered most of the ramp trying to figure out how the brakes worked and how to steer and stuff like that. Finally get out to number one. And I couldn't remember exactly how that business went with mixture and throttle and a prop and all that. So I just took all three of them, pushed them full forward, and off we go. We hadn't gone very far before the torque kicked in. And off to the left I go. So now I'm running through the grass, but I got it back onto the runway. And we kept going a little bit further and finally got it airborne, staggering off. Go straight ahead for a while. I pull up to the left, and as we're turning downwind, I'm turning base, and I thought the F-100 turns base at about 200, 190, 200 knots. I'll just cut it in half, and so I tried to turn base at about 100 miles an hour. Airplane wouldn't go that fast. As I turned final, I'm still trying to get some airspeed out of the airplane. When I got over the end of the runway, I was going about 100, 105 maybe. I flared halfway down the runway before I got low enough, before I could bounce it onto the runway. Bouncing on the runway a couple of times. Torque kicked in again. Off to the left, we go again through the mud and the dirt, and we stop. And the guy in the back, I'm thinking, he's going to kill me for uh, damaging his airplane. So he turns around with a big smile, and he gives me a big thumbs up. And I look out behind him, and here comes a Jeep with, two young Vietnamese guys in it. And a captain is getting out and he hands me a little tiny sheet of paper with coordinates on it. And then a young non rated second lieutenant from the Vietnamese Air Force gets up, gets in the back seat, and the interpreter says, those are the coordinates of your first airstrike. And so taxi back onto the runway, took off, and off to my first airstrike. Wow. So what an introduction to the first of your four tours in Vietnam. And Bob, we're really going to get into it here, but I appreciate that story because what a different mindset that the Air Force had from a risk level perspective, because they knew the stakes were incredibly high as we're kicking off this clandestine part of the war. Uh, You start going to do essentially forward air control missions and close air support in a small propeller airplane, under-trained, but you know what you need to do. And I think that mindset is a lot different than what we've grown into as a technical air force. But with some of the threats that we're going to face in the future, we may be leaning back into this mindset. One of the takeaways from that is that obviously I was working for the CIA at the time, and their management style was, we'll tell you what we want you to do, you go do it, we're not going to bother you. You'll learn how to fly the airplane. You're obviously going off to fight. And so the mission of the United States Air Force was the, let's go fly and fight. And so you learn how to fly, and you go learn how to fight. Simple as that. So I think I got about, I don't know, give or take about 75 missions with that squadron while we're there. It was very much like World War I, shooting out the side windows and sitting on a World War II flak jacket. Yeah, you guys were having to innovate uh, real time and on the fly. And I know that we probably can have three podcasts just talking about your experience on that first tour. Definitely going to invite you back and talk about more of this from a very specific perspective. But we've got a lot of ground to cover. So we wrapped up that tour. And now you go back to the F-100 for your second tour. And we're in still the early 60s. Now you're back flying the F-100, but you are flying out of Clark in the Philippines. Is that right? About a year and a half after that first tour, they uh, redeployed my squadron out of Misawa and back to uh, England Air Force Base in Louisiana. And then from there, we went TDY over to Clark Air Base to prep for the strikes into North Vietnam. That was late fall of 64. 
we deployed over to Clark and we flew out of Clark over to Da Nang prior to the strikes, uploaded, turned the birds around and went north. During this time, obviously you're massively engaged, as you mentioned, but then you also have another threat living off the end of the runway at Clark. So I definitely want to talk about this with our folks because it's really instrumental in how the rest of your tours go. Yeah. So as it turns out, the deal was, I said earlier or before, we would take off from Clark, fly over to Da Nang, turn the birds around, go north. So one day I was the early takeoff, I guess it was 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. The communist huck organization, huck like an H-U-K, was causing a lot of problems up in Luzon at that during that particular time. And they had set, unknown to us, they had set up a, a ZSU at the end of the runway. So I go out en route to Da Nang, taxi out, take off, nose will lift off, I don't know, 20, 30 feet in the air, cross over the end of the runway, and all of a sudden, bang, there's a huge explosion. Cockpit fills with fire, and instinctively, you just pull up high to the right, kept it in burner, found myself at about 1,500 feet, but I'm over the city of Angeles in the Philippine Islands, and so about that time, a second explosion occurs. Cockpit fills with more fire. You're sitting here, it's, think about it as sitting in a bonfire. Obviously, what I need to do is get the airplane away from the city, because if I punch out, the bird's going to go down, and we got a full airplane full of gas and ammo and what have you. And obviously, you don't want to be dropping that into the middle of the city and killing a bunch of men, women, children, families, whatever. So I make a turn out to try to get it over some field of elephant grass away from the city. Third explosion occurs. Flight control system apparently burned through, nose drop, started to roll inverted. And that's when I realized that the flight control system had burned through and then punched out, got out about 800 feet, nose down. Unfortunately, the chute did not have enough time to open. So I hit in a small, narrow jungle stream about 10, 15 feet wide. And that probably saved my life because I went into it up to my chin and the mud. In there for a few seconds trying to figure out how my morning was going. And I felt these things bumping into me. I looked around and sure enough, I had jumped into the creek with some snakes in it. As the snakes were bumping into me. First thought is, okay, I'm going to die of snake bite of the nose or something like that. So I crawled out of the, up the bank out of there. By the time I got up the bank and into the elephant grass, here come a handful or so of bad guys, maybe eight or ten of them. And their intent, I think, was to try to capture me and take me prisoner. And based on my first tour, I realized that being a prisoner of a small guerrilla group is not the best thing in the world, not a very good option. So we had a very small disagreement over that, and I managed to continue to get through the elephant grass and. About that time, an army chopper landed at the edge of the tree line and in the elephant grass. So I managed to get over to the chopper and hitchhike to a ride back to the hospital at Clark. Yes, the incredible thing, Bob, obviously you just punch out on takeoff, but you continue this tour for the next five months and continue going north and dropping bombs. Can you talk to us about what the rest of that tour looked like from an engagement standpoint and and what you saw. And Bob, the thing that I want to get here now is you talk to 20% attrition rate. We're losing people. You got to be really resilient. It's something that only war prepares you for when you come back and one of your wingmen doesn't make it or one of the guys has a mechanical and punches out and then you know that they've been taken prisoner because you watched it happen. And I think you had mentioned, you know, a sortie or two. We don't have to get super into it, but I just really want to get to you are not in a passive environment at all, and you got to be really tough. And this is where we're gently kind of saying, you know, if the Air Force doesn't remember its history, you're going to have a bunch of underprepared mentally uh, and physically folks that would not have done as well as you did because you guys had this kind of built-in grit mentality. So a typical 100 squadron back in those days, we had a 
annual attrition rate of about 20%. So use a Misawa as an example. So we had two F-100 squadrons there. That meant you got to go to the funeral of one of your friends every month. You learn very early that you have to be pretty well calloused over. You have to be accepting of death and injury at a much higher level than most people think about. That builds a mental toughness that's very difficult to describe. But like I said earlier, it's almost like you're calloused over and death becomes such a commonplace thing for you and your friends. When we got over to Da Nang for the first strikes up in, in the north, we thought we were pretty tough, but I can still vividly remember my first strike into uh, North Vietnam. And as I'm crossing the fence, I'm listening on guard channel to guys punching out, airplanes going in, guys going in with the airplanes and dying. And it was almost a constant chatter of that. The hair on the back of your neck goes up and you think, oh my God, welcome to combat. So, Bob, having understood this, and I want to go back to the ejection that you had a few months before, five to six months before, is when you wrap up this tour and you guys make it back to England, Air Force Base. So, talk to me about your injuries and the recovery that you had. Yeah, okay. So, we redeployed squadron back to England Air Force Base. By that time, physically, I was in pretty bad shape. Turns out that my uh, back had been broken in three places, and I'd done a lot of damage to the spinal cord, and the left side of my body wasn't working very well. I was in a lot of pain. When we got back to the States, the doc sent me over to the Wilford Hall Hospital in San Antonio. I got hooked up with a nurse there that was exploring a concept where she could teach people to use alternate muscles for mobility and stuff like that. By that time, I was in a wheelchair, pretty much paralyzed from the waist down. And when I got to the hospital, the neurosurgeons and the orthopedic surgeons couldn't help. So this woman was my best, probably last hope. And she worked with me for several months. Finally, they released me from the hospital, went back home, didn't have any uh, orders. And just before I got home, my squadron was redeployed back, uh, PCS back to Ben Air Base in Vietnam. They left me behind, probably because I was the slacker. So I packed the bag. It was, it was Christmas Eve of 65. Packed the bag, caught a hop up to California in a bar on Christmas Eve, all by myself and a bartender. Another guy walks in, joins us, and conversation got around and say, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm trying to catch a flight to Saigon. He said, my squadron's over there, and I need to go join them. And he said, why don't you just use your orders and go the normal way? And I said, well, I don't have any orders. He said, you mean you're AWOL? He said, probably technically. He said, okay, well, I happen to be the aircraft commander. And I'm flying over to Saigon tomorrow morning. He and I kept talking, and he agreed that if I'd showed up on a ramp at about, I don't know, 6 or 7 o'clock the next morning with my gear, he'd smuggle me on his airplane and fly me over to Saigon. So we did. The only restriction was I couldn't get off the airplane, but it was big transport, so pretty comfortable. Finally, we get to Saigon, get off the airplane. He gets a pickup truck, and he throws my gear in the back of the pickup truck, and we drive out to the main gate of Tonsonut, which was the major airport in Saigon. I got my gear out. I walked out the main gate and caught a Vietnamese taxi and got a taxi ride to I base at Benoit, walked in, checked in with uh, D.O., and I said, here I am. I'm here. Where's my squadron? Where do I go to sign up? We started that tour off with him explaining to me some of the military details that I had overlooked in my trip over to Benoit. And finally, after about five or 10 minutes of that, I think he gave up on me, and he said, okay, well, grab your gear, go down to your squadron, and suit up and uh, go back for your area check. Yeah, and it's pretty incredible to think that if you would have just discharged yourself or been discharged and gone back to England Air Force Base, your squadron had left without you and you would have been 
stuck with one of the other squadrons and not going back to war. So you solve that problem by getting yourself there is really incredible and a great story, of course, but obviously a testament to your tenacity to want to continue to fight in this war. So now you're on tour number three in the F-100 flying, and this is a lot is going on now. As you mentioned, the time frame is 1965. And this is where you really engage. And I want to go back later on in detail, but this is where you receive the Silver Star. It was, uh, if there was such a thing in combat, it was my favorite tour. My squadron was 100% close air support and working closely with the Army, closely with special operations teams. And you flew every day, frequently, two or three times a day. I recall one day I was on the alert hangar. I got five rides that day off the uh, alert pad, but that was only because the missions were only 25 or 30 minutes because we were bombing the other end of our own runway because the Viet Cong had overrun that portion of the runway. But social schedule was really light. You literally flew every day and about every month or Six weeks or so, you got a week off and went off. But it was an absolutely great tour. You get so much satisfaction out of, it's almost like being in a, I don't know, a knife fight in a phone booth is what the way we used to describe it. But you get so much intense satisfaction out of working so closely with the United States Army. And all of the strikes were low and fast. And so it was a very personal business to be close to your target, watching the effects of your strikes and stuff like that. So it was um, clearly for me, my favorite tour. All right, Bob. So now you have a third tour under your belt and it's time to pay the piper. You can't continue in combat and keep flying tour after tour. So they send you back to Luke as a combat hardened, super experienced aviator to go be an IP at Luke and train the new studs that are going to be coming over in country. So can you talk to us about the training and the experience and the mindset that you brought to those new students? Yeah. By that time, we're talking about 19, end of 66, 67. So we'd been at the war for, or at least I'd been at the war for five years, let's say, roughly. And all of the angst and all of the frustrations that we experienced at the beginning of the Vietnamese War really floated to the surface. One of the big deals was the fact that we were so poorly trained. Doesn't mean to say we weren't flying the airplane. We got lots of time in the airplane. The problem is that they were training us for the wrong war. At that time, late 50s and early 60s, the fighter force was largely sitting alert throughout the world and everything was geared towards a nuclear war. And as a result, they neglected the air-to-air side of the game and the air-to-ground side of the game. While we were getting hours, we're probably getting 30 plus hours a month of flying time, each mission about an hour and a half. The problem was it was training us for the wrong war. You couple that with what I viewed, and I think almost everybody agreed, was a distinct lack of leadership and a combination. Ended up killing far more people than we needed to. The attrition rate on fighter pilots was very high. 20% was probably the norm, and it went up to 30 and 40%, depending on which particular mission your squadron was assigned to. When I went back to Luke, there was a couple of things that I wanted to change. First of all, we didn't have a combat tactics manual. So everything that you learned through on-the-job training was passed down word of mouth from you to the replacement. So anyway, so one of the things I did was I wrote that manual for our airplane. When we were at Luke, as an IP, you typically flew maybe once or twice a day, got 30-plus hours a month, got a lot of time in a seat. The people coming through had been gathered up from all the different commands, none of them had fighter experience. The majority of them coming through were going to get a check out as a fighter pilot, then deploy over to Vietnam as a forward air controller, not fly fighters again. 
So we would fly, like I say, all day, every day, just trying to get them through their six-month program to give them, get them blessed as a fighter pilot. Bob, we kind of mentioned it before, but I want to ask you about just the combat culture and the general acceptance of risk that you took with you, or was, which was probably the norm, but it seemed like it really had this sense of resilience that was just really baked into squadron life. Well, I think that's true. You travel all around the world with 25 guys. You spent more time with them than you did with your family. And so it was an extended family. It was very tight. But what happened is you, you developed a culture. The culture was really different. First of all, I think most of the guys, not that you look forward to it, but I think most of the guys accepted the fact that they were probably not, I shouldn't say, I think most people accepted the fact that the death rate among your friends was very high. And generally speaking, after a couple of years, you accepted the fact that you were probably going to die. In fact, when I was going through training, I went through training at Dallas, the instructors used to tell you that if you're in this business and you live to be 30, it's because you're not trying hard enough and you're not far enough out on the edge. By the way, just as a takeaway, I punched out on my 30th birthday. And, I, and so I thought to myself, I wonder how they knew that. But anyway, but it was part of the culture. It was work hard, fly all day long, be in a cockpit, finish flying, go to the bar, drink with your friends, go home, wake up the next morning at six o'clock and go do the same thing all over again, do it every day of your life. Yeah. And, and I think I had a similar experience as well, not as routine, but the fact that we flew a bunch, getting 10 sorties a month was a norm. You're saying you're flying 30 hours a month. So obviously even a lot more than I was, but I think, uh, you know, as we have leaned onto technology, we're probably not flying the pace that we should just from a, a human integration to the machine, whatever that is. Simulators are great as we all know, but obviously just getting air under your butt, as we say, it is probably the way to go. I, and I do appreciate that mindset that you're explaining to us. But I do want to get through to your last tour because you do three years at Luke as I'm reading through your bio. And you have to pay the piper again because although you weren't flying in the war, you were still flying. So you work with the personnel folks and take a tour in Turkey, a non-flying tour for two years, bring your family so you can then get an F-4 checkout and become the fight in Fujin, the fourth fighter squadron commander, and you go back to Vietnam. So can you talk to us about how you work that drug deal? Because it's another one that's pretty incredible that you get a fourth tour where you will achieve over 500 missions in Vietnam. So after about three years as a uh, instructor pilot at Luke, gets repetitions. So I decided what I, and you know, and you're watching all these guys go back over to Vietnam and you're sitting there back in the States enjoying Phoenix, Arizona. But as I was passing through my second year there and entering my third, I got really antsy. And I felt it was time for me to go back to back over to Vietnam, go back to work with the guys. And so I called up the personnel guys and said, hey, I want to go back to Vietnam. And they said, can't do it. He, no, no one's allowed to go back for a fourth tour. And in talking to the guy, I said, however, comma, if you wanted to go to Libya, for two years. Then we could work a deal where you spend two years in Libya, or as it turned out, in my case, in Insula, Turkey. And at the end of that, you will have been out of combat for five years. We'll approve you going back for your fourth tour and the sweeten the pot. We'll give you an F4 checkout. And that was a big deal because if I had stayed in Luke, I probably would have ended up checking out in the F-111. And that was uh, like number 87 on my list of things I want to do. Anyway, so I said, okay, Turkey, here we come. So I packed up the family, went over to Turkey. And by the way, that was a terrific tour. I loved it. It was my introduction to terrorism in the Middle East and got to work all kinds of interesting intelligence things out of Beirut and Cyprus and other places. But anyway, so the way I got back on my fourth tour was by spending two years, two and a, actually two and a half years in Turkey. Then I got to check out and back over to Udorn to um, manage the fighting Fujians. Yeah, it, it, and that's an incredible timeline. And looking through your bio, you had just missed 
linebacker two had just wrapped up and the squadron had moved to Udorn where they would ride out the rest of the war. And you were essentially one of the last commanders leading a F-4 squadron in combat, but you guys were still continually engaged there. Yeah. Being a squadron commander, I think, for a fighter pilot, the epitome of the career. But in any case, yeah, I didn't get there until just that after linebacker two was finished. And I was really bummed out because I, quite frankly, was really looking forward to participating in, in linebacker. But in any case, once linebacker was over, it was pretty much agreed that the war was, for all intents and purposes, going to be ending very soon. So part of your job as a squadron commander is to make sure that you don't kill your people at the end of a war unnecessarily because uh, you're to a great extent, you're going through the motions. Our combat, we did a few things up in Laos and stuff like that, but primarily we work Cambodia. So our squadron get fried once or twice a day for missions down into Cambodia. And that was good, but you could tell the sense of things. The psychology was that the war was coming to an end. And um, me as a squadron commander, I really felt strongly the responsibility to do everything I could to make sure that I didn't lose anybody unnecessarily. And then what happened, but peace jumped out. And then we started to return to the regular Air Force and what near as interesting as combat. You certainly had enough of it to really be able to gauge the comparison between a combat Air Force and an in garrison Air Force. And you then continued on a few other assignments, being what we would call now the group commander, the DO at Osan Air Base, flying slatted E's. And that had to be a hoot. And then, of course, a uh, final assignment before you retire. And uh, I do, I know we're always getting uh, long on time. And Bob, we're definitely going to have you back for a really in depth discussion on some of these stories that you have. But I really want to end on a flying story, which the epitome of your flying career, I would assume, is being the recipient of the nation's third highest honor, the Silver Star, which is just absolutely incredible. So if you wouldn't mind, please indulge us with the story of how you received the Silver Star. We're flying out of Benma Air, Air Base, about 50 miles north of Saigon, and it's monsoon season. And this particular period of a couple of days, the weather really turned lousy. Ceilings were about 500 feet, viz maybe a mile and a half, rain constantly. Tops of the clouds were maybe three or 4,000 feet. But on this particular day, the weather was so bad that headquarters grounded all of the f flights in the country, at least in the southern half of the country that I'm familiar with. And so I and a friend of mine were uh, on alert at the end of the runway uh, out of uh, Benoit and figured we'll catch up on our sleep, write a couple of letters, read a book, do whatever. It's going to be a slow day and we can't fly against the rules. So after an hour or so, we got a phone call from the headquarters command post, and it said, we have a dire emergency. It turns out that the North Vietnamese troops massed up in Cambodia came across the border from Cambodia in force and were in the process of overrunning U.S. Army fire base on the western part of Vietnam, up in Tinian province, up in the, around the Paris Peak, which was a hot spot in Vietnam at the time. They said a couple of thousand North Vietnamese troops, a couple of hundred Americans at the fire base, and they're about to be overrun. You're the only chance we have. Are you willing to break the rules and regs and go try to bail out uh, fire base? We had two birds, good load. We had CBU, two snake eyes, and 20 millimeter cannon. So we said, yeah, we're willing to do that. We'll go give it a shot. So we took off, ran out to the fire base, and sure enough, it's a hot spot. The fact talked us down through the clouds. Don't forget, when you're working over jungle, really common for trees to be 100, 200 feet high. So if you say the ceiling is at 500 and the trees are at 200, you're working in a tight, flat type operation. So once the fact talked talk us down, once again, below weather amendments for putting in an airstrike. So that's, by the way, regulation number two that we violated. My 
buddy, I was flying his wing. So he rolls in on the first pass. I roll in on my first pass. And coming in on the first pass, I got hammered really hard. So I pulled up, got up above the clouds. My buddy's uh, first name was Jack. Jack stayed down and he worked over the target while I tried to see if the airplane was flyable. Turns out that my fuel boost pumps had been shot out. And so the only way I could get fuel into the engine was gravity feed. And as a gravity feed into a jet engine is not a very successful type thing. But I found out that I could keep the thing alive if I flew just a little bit above stall speed. I would call 200, 215 knots, somewhere in there. I could not maneuver with any degree of severity. So everything had to be low and gentle and all of that. So I'm waiting for my lead to finish up with the firebase down there. And then he could limp home with me. Just as he comes up, we joined up. We got a call from the fact and he said, we've got another firebase that's in even worse shape. Turns out they think three to 4,000 North Vietnamese troops overrunning a firebase with about, I guess, give or take, three, 400 Americans in it. They're on the wire. That is the enemy troops were, were at and on the wire. The firebase had lowered the tubes of their artillery to fire into the wire. And it doesn't look like they're going to survive and they're going to be overrun momentarily. Would you guys be willing to put a strike in and help them out? The problem was is that Jack had a good airplane and no munitions left. I had a bad airplane and lots of munitions left, so it was a mismatch. Anyway, I told the fact that I'd be willing to give it a shot. He talked me down through the clouds. I agreed with the Army guys that I would put the airstrike in underneath their artillery barrage. And one of the most interesting things that I experienced was when I looked out, you know, obviously look out, I've got a couple of seconds to make a choice. I can either take a broken bird home or I can put in a strike. And if I put in a strike, I'm not going to live through it. It's going to be a one-way ticket. I couldn't punch out, even if I want to, because it looked like the top of an anthill. You got 4,000 bad guys down there. So you got an airplane that's not going to fly very well, and you're going to get shot up, and you're not going to be able to bail out. So what are your choices? The choice was, it's a fairly straight trade. One airplane, one fighter pilot for 400 American troops. So I said, okay, I'll put the strike in underneath the artillery. And I did. I probably made low and slow, probably 15, 20 passes. On the last pass, you could tell that the North Vietnamese forces had broken and were running back towards Camp Up. And literally, because of, you'd see clearly because of the fire zone around a fire base, he saw thousands of troops just running away. And so I thought, well, they don't know I'm out of ammo. And so I made two or three dry passes over the top at very low. 50, 75 feet, because I thought me doing that and then listening to the noise and seeing how fast might encourage them to run faster. So anyway, as it turned out, the bird was pretty badly shot up. Part of the canopy was shot off. Part of the instrument panel was shot off. The airplane itself, looking at the wings, were punched full of holes. Looked out the left wing, and my CBU pod was on fire and burning. I decided not to look out anymore. I just concentrated. Guys, it's not going to help. So I just focused on being inside the cockpit. The end of the story was that I was credited with destroying eight AAA positions and killing uh, over 1,500 North Vietnamese troops. That turned things around. And so then we got to, went back to Ben La. When I landed, the big surprise was that sure enough, actually the gear came down and the flaps came down. And I didn't have any flat tires. So that was a big plus. When I stopped at the end of the runway, the crew chiefs inspected the airplane. They counted 300 and, I want to say 330 or so holes. So the crew chiefs are out there and they're counting things over. They quickly agreed that the airplane was trashed, never fly again, couldn't repair it. And they literally plowed it off the end of the runway. 
as this is happening, the wing commander and DO drive up in their staff car, and it is clear that they're not very happy. As a matter of fact, they were a lot worse than not very happy. And so I'm standing at attention while they're pointing out to me that I think I violated five regulations and cost the United States Air Force an airplane. And I had to admit that they were correct. That's exactly what I did. So anyway, they say, okay, you're under arrest pending court martial. And they took me back and I presumed they meant house arrest, but I was living in a tent. So I guess that was tent arrest. And so they go back and I'm paying attention to my tent. At least the two colonels are taking turns chewing my butt up and down. Things are not looking good. So the, they're pretty much agreed that the court martial is a done deal. And about that time, an Army Brigadier General walks into the tent. It turns out he was the commander of the fire base that I had helped out. And he jumped in his helicopter and flew out to congratulate me and to, and to reward me for my work out there. So now we got two colonels arguing with their Brigadier General because the Army guy was going to say thank you and the two uh, Air Force colonels were going to put me in jail. I was standing at attention in the middle of it trying to be as small as possible and staying out between three very senior officers who were arguing with each other. I must tell you, though, that I was really pulling for the Army guy because, because <laughs> the Air Force guys were, it was a done deal. So anyway, as it turns out, the Army general passed his recommendations for decoration through Army channels to Air Force channels and back down. And so the deal they cut was, okay, the Air Force will drop charges. They may not forgive me, but they'll drop court martial charges. And the Army won, and I got an Army Silver Star. So, Bob, absolutely incredible. I can't say thanks enough for the time that you spent with us today. Again, open invitation to have you back on the Aerospace Advantage because folks like me and many people listening to this podcast know that we stand on the shoulders of giants, and you are certainly one of the ones that paved the way for us to have the careers and the experiences that we've had. So thank you so much, Bob. Thank you. So like, that was an awesome interview. Thank you so much for taking time on that. When you were sitting there with Colonel Graham, what were the main takeaways? You know, was there an overarching element that you really took away from his experiences? Yeah. The main thing is you just think about the dedication, not only of course, service before self and to the Air Force, but really to the squadron. And we know in the Air Force that at the squadron level, the camaraderie and the bond of being part of that unit is what makes warfare successful, right? As many people in history have said, you're typically not thinking about the strategic implications in a battle. You're fighting for your buddy in the foxhole, right? So I think those things really come out when Bob talks about his experience at Vietnam. Now, and I think another thing that's really important to consider, especially as we're looking at more high-end operations in the future, look how much authority was delegated down. He was making a lot of calls on his own, a reminder of what the CIA did with him, and maybe a little, need a little more support there. He was all alone and unafraid, but too much, but bottom line, they allowed him to get the job done and there was not crippling bureaucracy. And I think in the last 20 years, we've become way too comfortable with very, very centralized command and having to run approvals way too far north up the chain. And we are not going to have that ability, especially if we look at calm under threat and all that. We're going to have to empower the lieutenants and captains to really make calls in their own. What's another takeaway to I just want to piggyback quickly on that because I think Air Force leaders often talk about how the captains and the lieutenants are the ones that are really innovative. And they are. We just don't let them execute their innovation sometimes. So I think that was a huge takeaway for me, that if we let them do the job, they're going to do it and get results. It, you know, it might not be the most polished way of getting it done, but you're going to net results, which is huge. The other piece about it was he had the ability to take three tours and then bring that mentality back to Luke at the RTU. And I know in my experience and being at Aviano right after we had allied force. I knew I was walking into a legacy squadron. There were plenty of folks that had flown combat from that very building. So again, my first day walking in to the triple nickel, walk past the squadron patch on the floor and there's seven pilots standing at the ops desk, sanitized, 
They had their survival vests on. They had their nine millimeters on their chest with a round in the chamber, the safety off and the hammer pulled back. So you talk about a ready go to war squadron. I mean, that is what I walked into. And of course, airmen, you know, we've been at war for 30 years because we never really stopped flying after Desert Storm between Northern Watch, Southern Watch, and then getting into the post 9-11 world. But the stakes were different going into a passive environment that we flew in in Iraq and Afghanistan compared to what was off the end of the runway at Aviano, thinking about Bosnia and Kosovo and continuing to do peacekeeping missions there. We knew that there was a threat because General Goldfein just a couple of years before had gotten shot down there. So we know that as part of the fabric of the United States Air Force's history and being part of that in my personal experience was really eye-opening. And I think over the years in the permissive environment, we take that for granted. Now, in, I'm glad you brought that up because another takeaway I had from this, think of the high intensity nature of the ops that you described and the risks that the air crews are taking and what it meant numerically. He kept referring to 20% attrition. We have not had to consider that in decades and the force is not sized for it. If you look at the training pipeline, we've brought that capacity down way too little. We've had a persistent 1900 fighter pilot shortfall for years. That is in peacetime. There is no way you could sustain that kind of 20% attrition in combat with pilot training pipeline that is this challenge right now. We don't have enough jets. We can't take those losses because we already have too few combat aircraft across the board, fighters, bombers, whatever. We don't have the flow through at depots and in spare parts supplies, all that to maintain what is truly involved with high intensity operations. And the training piece, when, you know, you're referred to it, that, that experience, bringing it back to the RTU, that is going to be crucial. And you cannot throw all of your varsity actors into the fold all at once. Cause if you do that, you don't have anybody to train the follow on the next generation. So we have to move forward with a very balanced force. And right now, I mean, we're hanging on the ragged edge of just too small and near in a stall and we got to build out of that. And that is so be, but surely something that's just essential, but you cannot flip a switch and get back to it. And then I just want to add in another one here. And that is, we talk a lot about ACE and that's agile combat employment. And that is really moving combat packages on the fly to different operating locations around a theater. So it's harder for the adversary to attack mega bases. Think about his stories and what he taught us about the threat. This is a guy that got shot down at the end of the runway at Clark, which is supposedly a very friendly region for us. And talk about the challenges that he had with that, the missions he was flying in the VC. They had the other end of the runway in their hands and he was bombing his own base. These are lessons we need to get very real about and what that means for our own forces in terms of security, what that means, what airbase defense looks like, base defense in general. We have not had to think like that in decades. We've got to get real about it. It plays back to nutrition, but it plays into also how we need to build out future capabilities and a balanced force to really provide sustainable air power under threat. The last thing I want to mention, Doug, is the training piece, because being a tail dragger pilot enjoyed his story about his first flight in the Vertok. And when I'm getting my tail dragger endorsement, right, of course, I can empathize with bouncing down the runway and not want to taxi off and that type of thing. But here's somebody who stepped up and got through it and made it happen, but obviously could have had training going into it. Now, yeah, these are heroic stories of folks that do that, but the Air Force itself knows that airmen are going to face these challenges where they may be underprepared. And it's one thing if it's something that we don't know about and we're kind of innovating on the fly, it's different when it's just a lack of training or preparedness. So I think that is one of the things that we can glean from hearing that story. Now, and if you look at the flight hours crews are getting each month, boy, I tell you, has got to dial back up. Dude, I cannot thank you enough for this interview and bringing Colonel Graham on the episode. And I just want to really hammer on what you said at the outset here of our getting off the stage and that is service before self. Remember that line he said, if you're not dead by 30, you're not trying hard enough. That is a mentality that, I mean, wow, that is incredible dedication and commitment to duty and the nation and everything. I think we're going to be challenged in ways like that in the future, but we've got to build an air force and a set of supporting structures that really support our airmen. So they are equipped to fly, fight, and win, and we've got a lot of work to do, 
And that is why it's so important to look back at history and realize we've been there before the past. Let's apply the lessons learned before the crisis kicks off because we have got to set these guys up for success. Our back is going to be up against the wall again, and we've got to get ready. You're right, Doug. And I thought I had one last thing to say, but I have to pile on to this because I'm in tune with talking to my friends that are still active duty. And of course, just from a social media standpoint, you can tell what the temperature of the squadron is. We never, I never talked about going to the airlines. It was something maybe, you know, if I retired in 50 years from now, I think, well, maybe I'll do that as a job. But the fact that we've got captains bragging about turning down the bonus and they're going to go make all this money at American or United or whoever it is, to me, that's the scary part because it's not that these airmen don't want to fly Raptors and Panthers and Vipers and everything else. Of course, they want to do it. But something is disruptive within squadron life, that squadron life is not as cool or fun as it would be. So they're looking at the airlines as a better alternative, 30 years old. I think that is the part that the Air Force really needs to look at because, man, you could have paid me minimum wage to where I could keep a roof over my head and drive my car back and forth to work because all I wanted to do was be a fighter pilot and fly fighters every day. So... I think that is something that the Air Force needs to take a good hard look at. No, man. Well, again, thank you so much. It's been awesome. Thanks, Doug. With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our guests for joining in today's discussion. I'd also like to extend a big thank you to our listeners for your continued support and for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you've heard today, don't forget to hit that like button and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. You can also leave a comment to let us know what you think about our show or areas you think we should explore further. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, and you can always find us at mitchellaerospacepower.org. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe and check six.